Uh, we are truly a family, an uh, online family. And uh, if you have any prayer requests, please uh, write me there in the comment, se uh, comment section uh, what you need. And, you know, even if you as uh, someone that's reading can see someone else's prayer request, you can also pray for them. But uh, I'm going to uh, set myself to, in this week that's coming, uh, to just go through those prayer requests and just to pray for each one of those things. And uh, I really uh, trust that the Lord will give you a breakthrough in the season. Now tonight, uh, I want to spend some time and talk about heaven will fight for you. And so that's my, my title for, for today. Can you maybe type for me in the comment section, heaven will fight for you. Actually, make it more personal, say heaven will fight for me. Heaven will fight for my family. And, you know, if you think about a, a friend or someone that, that you know that the Lord needs to really give breakthrough to, then you can say, well, you know what, uh, John, uh, Jack, uh, heaven is fighting for you. Uh, you can even uh, sp think about a city or a business or a country and say South Africa, heaven is fighting for you. And I'm going to talk tonight about how we can align ourselves with God so that heaven can indeed fight with us. And my case study is going to be around uh, a guy in the scripture many times is referred to as the centurion. And so it's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And so, but I want to, as a, as a base scripture, I want to start with this verse in James chapter 4, uh, verse 6. And it says there, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Yeah, this is a very, very important scripture. And so uh, I want us to just dissect it for, for a moment. Now, in the scripture, when um, uh, the, the Gentiles talk about God, they will always say the word God. Uh, but usually when the Gentiles re uh, uh, refer to God, they don't only talk about God. And it is especially so in the, in the uh, Greek language. Uh, when they use the word God, they could also refer to the heavens. They could refer to the government of heaven. They can also refer to God as the whole armies of heaven with God and the, uh, the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits of God, the, the cloud of witnesses, uh, all the angelic uh, powers, uh, and all of that together uh, is then God. And so therefore when you say God has defeated uh, uh, this army, then you, you talk about God with his angels, with his commanders, uh, with uh, you know the governors, the seven spirits of God, and all of them together uh, work together to, to overcome this. And so uh, when the scripture talks about uh, God, uh, it, it, it can mean just the singular person, our Father that's in heaven, but it can also mean the to totality uh, of heaven. And so that's why uh, in the Gospel of Mark, uh, Mark, you know, being a Jew and writing to Jews, he didn't really want to use God. Uh, in those days, it was actually not even legal uh, for a normal person to use the word God. So uh, when they write the name of God, they would just write the Yod, the Hay, the Vath, and Hay, but they would not pronounce the name. Uh, and many of the people didn't even know how to pronounce the day. And even uh, until this day, there's many rubbish that says that, there's some rabbis that knows how to pronounce the name of God, but uh, most people do not know how to pronounce his name. And uh, so and that's why uh, in the scripture in Matthew, he doesn't say the kingdom of God. He actually talks about the kingdom of heaven. And the only reason why he says the kingdom of heaven, he's actually referring to God uh, and the whole government of, of God and the whole angelic structures. And so therefore he doesn't say the kingdom of God. He says the kingdom of heaven. Uh, uh, but it, it means the same thing. It's just, uh, the one is to the Jews, the other one is to the Gentiles. And so here uh, is James and he is talking uh, to uh, the people that's in Jerusalem uh, and they were a mixture of Gentiles uh, and Jews when he was writing the scripture. And you remember James was the pastor uh, and he, uh, they didn't always pray for him. So that's why he died early. Uh, okay, but uh, that's another story. It says here, so uh, God resists the proud. So uh, you can say it like this. Uh, God is resisting you if you have pride in your life. Uh, that, that pride is really, in essence, uh, rebellion against God. You don't 
You want to think your own thoughts. You want to do your own thing. You don't want to think God's thoughts and do what He wants you to do. So it says God will resist the proud. But uh, uh, that means actually all the angels will resist you. Uh, the favor of God will not be upon you. Uh, the, the heavens will not be opened against you. Uh, um, to an extent, the, the gates of the enemy will be open in your life for the enemy to come and steal, kill and destroy in your life. Uh, and that is what will happen to you when you have pride in your life. So pride is a terrible thing in our life. And so uh, we need to come before God and repent and say, Lord, I don't want to uh, have pride in my life. Actually, you know, uh, the, the devil or, or Satan, uh, which was Lucifer in heaven, had an abundance of trading. Uh, and there was uh, pride in him. And he actually says that he is more beautiful and more powerful than God. And because of that pride and that abundance of trading, uh, he was cast out of heaven. And so the fall uh, of uh, one third of all the angels was before because of pride. And so therefore, when it says there, God resists the proud, uh, there's a lot of substance in those words. And so I don't want God to resist me, but I, I want him to give me favor. I want him to fight on my behalf. And then it continues to say there, but gives grace to the humble. All right, so now the grace of God is the expression of God's love towards you. Uh, the grace of God is also His divine enablement uh, towards you. Um, in, in other words, when God gives you uh, His grace, uh, that means that you uh, have the ability uh, to function on a divine level. Uh, you can have boldness on a divine level. Uh, you can pray for six people and see them recovered uh, as if Jesus was standing there and doing it because His Spirit is inside of you. And so the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that we receive is part of the grace of God that He puts on our lives. Uh, the grace of God is also that He divinely uh, set in place interceptions on your life where you would intercept with people, key people that you will network with that will minister to you and will speak life to you. So you can think about your life when you gave your life to Jesus. There was that one person that the Lord sent to you or there was a program or somehow God intersected your life uh, with someone that could bring the gospel of the Lord Jesus to you so that God could express his love to you and you can be saved and you can be healed and you can be set on a, part, uh, on a course of restoration and destiny and vision. And so that's what God wants to do with you. He wants to give you his grace. And so that's, that's our key scripture. That's our foundation scripture. And I want to tell you right now, if you want heaven to fight on your behalf, then you need to repent of pride and, and simply just repent of being rebellious and not believing God and say, Lord, I'm going to believe your word. I'm going to receive it and I'm going to start to act on obedience to the word of God. I'm going to allow that words to be upon my mouth. I'm going to meditate it on uh, in, in my mind day and night and I will be like this tree that's planted by uh, the river of life uh, and so then what actually happens when I lay down that pride and I humble myself before God humble uh, in this sense simply just means to say yes Lord Lord I receive your word I receive your mandate your instruction I realize that my life is not about myself but my life is about living for you uh, and then when I humble myself then the Lord releases his favor releases his grace his divine enablements his power uh, those divine intersections is coming to you uh, and then the heavens opens and the resources of, of God is coming upon your life now uh, let's go to our case study uh, the centurion and I love the centurion uh, for the longest time I thought it was my favorite person uh, in the scripture uh, and so uh, let's just quickly look at a few uh, verses about the centurion. Now, first of all, the centurion uh, loved uh, God. Uh, he loved the Jewish people. He understood that the Jewish people is God's people. And he knew that somehow he is going to receive his salvation through uh, those people. And so what he did is he built a synagogue for them. So he took his hard-earned money uh, and he spent the money on the building project to build a synagogue in the region where he was. And you remember when a synagogue is built, uh, then the government of God is coming into a region and God can set his elders in place and, you know, the, the economy in the area can function properly. And so uh, the Jews actually said to Jesus that this man was deserving. Now, we're going to go now and look at the story about a, a servant of him then that became very sick and was paralyzed uh, in bed. 
And so uh, Luke chapter 7 uh, talks about that, but I want to uh, do the, the version that's in uh, Matthew chapter 8. It's the same story, it's just two different accounts of the same story. So in Matthew 8 we read the following from verse 5, Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him. So now this is this centurion that the scripture uh, talked now. And the first uh, two times when the scripture talk about the, uh, the centurion, it says a centurion. And then it shifts over to the centurion. Actually in Luke uh, chapter 7, uh, I, I don't have that verse in here, but it refers to the centurion as the centurion. And so you see quite a few times in scripture when it refers to the centurion, not as if it's any centurion, but it's uh, actually a specific person that they're referring to here. And so they talked about uh, the centurion that came to Jesus and he and he asked Jesus, he actually sent his servants to talk with Jesus. Uh, and he asked Jesus, Lord, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. For only, uh, only speak a word and my servant will be healed. And, you know, we re read later on how Jesus marveled at this centurion of the faith that he had. That he knew that Jesus can just speak a word and his servant can be healed. And that's also what happened. Jesus spoke a word and within that hour uh, the, the servant was healed. So that's, that's amazing. So this is kind of gives us this picture of the centurion. So this centurion, first of all, he built the synagogue. He loved the Jewish people. And then uh, because of his uh, humbleness, remember he had the resources uh, to build the synagogue and he said to the Lord, Lord I'm not going to be full of pride and rebellion, but I'm going to humble myself before you and I'm going to do what you want me to do. And so the Lord said to him, okay, well, I want you to build the synagogue for the Jews. And he did that. And because of that, uh, there was grace upon his life uh, that was bestowed by him. Remember, there was a woman, uh, a Greek woman that said, well, come and pray for my child. And then Jesus said, no, uh, because I was not sent uh, to the Greeks. I was sent to the Jews. Uh, and then she says, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, please, just this one time pray for me. And he said, no, I can't take the food from the table and give it to the dogs. And she said, well, sometimes the dogs get some of the, the crumbs that falls off the table. So she was kind of very persistent. Yeah, but she didn't really uh, do that much to be able uh, to have the grace of God upon her life. Now, this guy, uh, he is uh, uh, from the Italian regiment, uh, the centurion. And yet, uh, Jesus didn't even blink an eye. Uh, he immediately went to him and he, and he spoke the word of his servant and his servant was healed. Why was that so? It was because two things. Number one, uh, the centurion humbled himself uh, before God. And number two, he repented of his pride uh, and he came into line with what God was saying. And the moment he did that, then the favor and the grace of God was upon his life. Is that not quite amazing? And that's also why God blessed him with finances to be able to do what he did. Now, at the time when Jesus was crucified uh, on the cross, um, uh, there was Pilate. Pilate uh, acted as a governor, but also as a judge uh, to make a decision for Jesus to be crucified. And he didn't actually want Jesus to be crucified, but uh, because of uh, the pressure from the Jews, he, he gave in and he let it happen. Um, and it was actually determined by God to, to be so. And even the, the centurion's wife had the dream to say, don't do this. Uh, but then there was this guy, the centurion, and this is the exact same centurion. Uh, and that centurion uh, kind of was a, a right-hand man uh, with Pilate. So you can imagine this centurion was blessed enough that he could build a, a synagogue. Um, uh, the, Jesus didn't uh, uh, think twice to pray for him for his servant to be healed. And he had favor uh, with Pilate. And so um, uh, at the crucifixion, uh, the centurion went to the to the cross. He didn't have any fear. He was a Roman, uh, and he stood there uh, and he looked at Jesus because he know this is the man that healed my servant. Uh, and it says here in um, let's see uh, Mark chapter fifteen, and I'm reading the last part of verse thirty-seven. It says, and Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That's a very, very important thing that has happened. And in verse 39, So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the son of God. 
You know, uh, who else had a revelation that Jesus was the Son of God? It was Peter. Remember Peter? You know, Jesus asked him, who do you say I am? And then the one said this and that and the other. Uh, but then Peter says, no, you are the Christ, you are the Son of God. Now, here's a guy who's a Roman citizen. Uh, this guy, uh, uh, Italian guy, uh, but he believed in Jesus. He, he honored God. He uh, loved his people. He built a synagogue. Jesus immediately healed uh, him. And he was right there where Jesus was dying. And so he, he was looking at this man. He knew this man healed my servant. And then he made this proclamation. He says, truly, this man was the son of God. Is that not amazing that this guy, uh, you know, on the day when Jesus died, he believed in, in, in God. Now, you would now think... Is, does this was that guy then a Christian at this stage? I mean, he knew about Jesus, he loved Jesus, uh, he spent all that money, um, and, and yet he didn't receive the Holy Spirit. No one uh, prayed for him, um, but he believed in God, and he actually made the proclamation in front of all those people. And that was not a popular thing to do because you remember it was those uh, uh, um, religious leaders of the Jews was there, the women was there, they were all crying, then all these Roman soldiers was there, and then he said to all these people, truly. This man was the son of God. This is centurion speaking. They're not amazing. Okay? So, uh, and then we can also read here in Luke chapter 23. Uh, it's just a continuation of the same story. Uh, so it says, So when the centurion saw what had happened, he began praising God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. Uh, and that's in Luke 23, 47. So he, he praised the Lord. He go in, when Jesus died, he praised the Lord now. You know, when when someone die in your life, you usually would cry uh, and you would think, well, uh, there's no eternity, you know. But this guy, he had a, a, a vision for eternity, he had a vision uh, for God to, some, to do something bigger than life. And that's why when Jesus died, he praised God. He was like, go and look at the scripture. There's not another person that praised God. He's the guy that praised God. Uh, there's not another guy when Jesus died that says that he's the son of God. That was the centurion that did that. That's why he's such a, a favorite of my uh, characters in the Bible. Okay. And so then what happened uh, is he helped uh, uh, Pilate uh, and he got this guy Joseph that had a tomb as a wealthy uh, Jewish man and he arranged for Jesus' body to be buried. Uh, let's see the scripture. So Pilate wanted if he was dead by the storm. So Pilate, you know, wondered if, because he knew the Sabbath was about to start. Now, they had, uh, in those days, in a Passover feast, they had the Sabbath uh, on the Thursday and had the Sabbath on the Saturday. So that means Jesus was crucified on the Friday evening. <laughs> so now this is very, very scary because, you know, people always celebrate the crucifixion of Jesus on a Friday. No, but he was really crucified on a Wednesday. This is the timeline is like this. On the on the Tuesday, they had the Passover. Then that evening of Tuesday, uh, he uh, was captured and they started the court case. Then on the Wednesday, uh, around about lunchtime, Jesus was crucified. Uh, and then a uh, year in the afternoon, he, he breathed out his last breath. Uh, and uh, the, the temple was torn in two, that's just after three o'clock in the afternoon, and then they put him in the tomb, and they had to get him into the tomb before six o'clock, because then the Passover Sabbath was to start on the Wednesday evening at six o'clock. Now, you know, people uh, uh, always want to you know, talk about when was Jesus resurrected out of the dead. Now, you remember he had to be uh, dead for three days. So let's just quickly count uh, together. So he, he was crucified the Wednesday night. So in other words, uh, Thursday night is day number one. It's uh, 24 hours. Uh, then Friday evening at 6 o'clock. You know, that's when he, the second time when he was, uh, two days after he was in the tomb. Uh, that's two days. And then uh, Sunday, uh, Saturday evening at 6 o'clock uh, is day number three. And so um, uh, the understanding is that Jesus was, uh, when when the at nightfall of that Saturday evening, uh, that Jesus was raised from the dead, and that's why uh, the soldiers also testified that in the night uh, they saw this bright light. Uh, the, the 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 stone was rolled away, uh, and then uh, Jesus was taken uh, out. Uh, and then uh, it says that in the, in the morning before but, uh, daybreak, it was around about four or five o'clock in the morning uh, that Mary. Uh, went to the 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 um, 
uh, what, the, the tomb and Jesus was not to be found there. And so therefore we knew that Jesus was probably resurrected from the dead actually the Saturday evening at 6 o'clock. And, and that would be the right time to do it because that's the beginning of the new uh, uh, week. And so uh, Jesus was raised up in uh, the beginning. And so it's the same, you know, uh, when he, when he uh, was born. Uh, the expectation that he was also born on the first of Nisan, uh, which was uh, Nisan means the beginning, and first is also beginning, so it's the, he is the beginning of the beginning. So now coming back to Pilate, a little uh, rabbit trail here in Mark chapter 15, 44. So Pilate wondered if he, uh, Jesus was dead by this time. And he's summoning the centurion. So he called with the, for the centurion. Now remember the centurion was standing in front uh, where Jesus was crucified. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, a Roman guard would usually be between 500 and 1,000 soldiers. And a, a centurion is usually a man that will then be in charge of them. A century means a, a hundred, uh, but usually the, cent the centurions actually had uh, closer to 500 to 1,000 people that they were uh, in charge over. And so this centurion had a guard. A guard is now, remember, 500 soldiers. He had a guard and they were watching over Jesus. Uh, and so uh, he called the centurion. So the centurion is kind of the leader of the guard. Uh, and then Pilate asked the centurion and he said to him, you know, was Jesus already dead? And then the centurion says, praise God, he was dead. He was a righteous man. He was the son of the living God, you know. Uh, and then um, uh, it says there, and asserting uh, uh, this from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. So what actually happened there is the centurion actually explained uh, to Pilate. Listen here. And I'm sure Pilate understood how it worked, but the whole idea was Jesus had to be in the tomb before six o'clock. And so they talked with one another and then the centurion, uh, with the help of Pilate, they said, well, let's use this guy. Joseph is a wealthy Jewish man. He already has a tomb uh, and it's close to the uh, the city. Uh, late, um, uh, let's give the body of Jesus to this uh, Joseph and Joseph can go and bury uh, Jesus in his tomb and that's also uh, what happened and so uh, the centurion was there all the way uh, all the way until Jesus was in the tomb the centurion built the synagogue he loved Jesus he he recognized that Jesus was the son of God now uh, in Acts chapter 2 then the Holy Spirit was poured out uh, and then the apostles started to minister the word now Jesus said to them go into all the nations uh, and preach the gospel uh, but uh, the disciples and the, the apostles didn't do that immediately. It took them approximately about 10 years before uh, they, uh, for the first time, really reached out to any person other than the Jews. And so let's see how that actually happened. Remember, the, the centurion was the first guy uh, that's not a Jew to say, uh, I believe in Jesus as the Son of God. And so uh, he, he prayed always, he, he gave alms to the poor, uh, and there was a lot of favor on his life. And he actually became a gate for the gospel to come to all the Gentiles. And you know, I'm a Gentile. Gentile simply means you're not a Jew. Um, and so uh, um, uh, the centurion became the gate for the gospel to go to the non-Jewish people. So now I want to read you the scripture. Um, so uh, this is... Uh, found in uh, Acts chapter 10. So there was a certain man in uh, Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian regiment. Now, uh, history uh, uh, um, will tell us that the centurion that they're talking about in Acts chapter 10 is exactly the same centurion that built the synagogue, is the same centurion that stood in front of Jesus, that proclaimed that Jesus is the Son of God. And so that's why there was an opening in that man's life. And it says here, it explains a little bit about him. You know, remember, uh, he loved the Jews. He built a synagogue. And it says here, he was a devout man and one who feared God and uh, with all his household. You know, so it was not only him, it was also his wife and his children and his servants. And he gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. So this guy was very generous. And we knew he was generous because he built uh, the synagogue. And, you know, giving alms to the people, meaning uh, if there was a poor person, he would give them food, he would give them clothes, and he would help them. Um, 
And then it says there, and he always prayed to God. Now, uh, a praying man is someone that hear God's voice, that has understanding of what God wants them to do, and they are aligned with what God is saying. And so, you know, we're talking about a man here uh, that the heaven is going to be uh, fighting on his behalf. Now, remember these uh, Jews, these uh, apostles, Jesus said to them, go into all the nations and preach the gospel. And for some reason, they're not going to the Gentiles. Already 10 years is over, and they're only preaching the gospel uh, to the Jews. Uh, there's a few examples in scripture where, you know, uh, Philip uh, ministered to the Enoch and he went to Samaria. And Samaria is kind of like people that's half Jew, uh, half, uh, um, you know, uh, half Jew, half uh, Greek um, uh, people. Uh, uh, but so the gospel went to Samaria, but it was they already heavily frowned upon them. These people just half Jews. Uh, and then there was the Enoch. Uh, but the, the, the gospel really haven't gone to the Gentiles yet. Uh, but this man, uh, the favor of God is upon his life. And so the Lord many, many times probably told these uh, Jews, I wanted to go to these Gentiles and minister to them. But they, for some reason, just didn't do it or they couldn't in their minds get it, get past the point to think, but how can I actually preach the gospel to a, a, a Gentile? They didn't actually think it's possible for a Gentile person a Gentile person to actually uh, love Jesus. Uh, and so then verse 3, And about the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. Now what's interesting about this is the ninth hour is uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and that's always the time uh, when people would go to the temple and pray. And so Cornelius didn't have access to the temple uh, to pray, uh, but he took the time to pray. You also read in the scripture about Daniel, that Daniel would go uh, in the afternoon when he, you know, is far away from the temple. He was in exile and yet uh, at the ninth hour he would pray. And so that's a, a time where there's a window uh, for, for breakthrough and prayer. And so I want to encourage you at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, if you have a few minutes, just take the time and just pray and just say to the Lord, you know, uh, um, I'm coming to you with prayer. Speak to me. I want to come in alignment and agreement with what you are saying. And so this is what happened with Cornelius. He was praying. And so as he was praying, uh, there came an angel uh, to him and the angel said to him, Cornelius. And then verse four, and so when uh, he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? So Cornelius saw this angel and now he's like, what, what's going on? And so the angel said to him, your prayers and your arms have come up for a, a memorial before God. So God was actually taking an account of everything that Cornelius was doing and was saying. And so he, the angel said to him, well, God saw what you were doing, how you humbled yourself before the Lord, how you uh, got rid of your pride uh, in your life. Uh, and how you aligned yourself with God. And so now he gave him instruction. Because he wants to give Cornelius uh, access to the Holy Spirit. So that Cornelius can be filled with the Holy Spirit. So he can pray in tongues. He can have the power of God. So that the gospel can actually go uh, to the Gentiles. And so then verse 5. Now send men to Joppa and send for Simon. Whose surname is Peter. And he is lodging with Simon a tanner. Whose house is by the sea. And he will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among the, uh, those who waited on him continually. Okay, and so uh, then the story continues of how uh, Peter was the next day praying and he saw the sheets going up and down. Uh, and then the next thing the Holy Spirit said to him, I see these guys. You gotta go with them and you gotta go and preach the gospel to Cornelius. And so when he came there to Cornelius, Peter started to explain to them the gospel. And while Peter was still speaking, the Lord jumped in and he filled them all with the Holy Spirit. They started to pray in tongues. And then uh, Peter said, Well, what keeps us from baptizing these people? Because they already believe in Jesus. Uh, and uh, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So let's baptize them. And they were baptized and they became the first. Uh, proper gentile christians in the in the scripture uh, and the lord used the good man uh, that was uh, that laid down his pride and humbled himself before god and opened up his wallet uh, he gave everything that he had to god and said lord i line up my life with you and so the lord could send the angel to him you know when the lord says uh, you know the the god resists the proud the proud it doesn't just mean God, it means the whole of God, the angels, the Holy Spirit, all of that. But when God gives grace to us, then it's also all of them. And so that's why the grace of God manifested in the Holy Spirit speaking to 
to Peter, uh, the angel coming and speaking to Cornelius. Remember, Cornelius didn't have the Holy Spirit yet, so it was difficult for him to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And so that's why God sent that angel to him. Uh, and, and there was this major blessing upon him, and he was filled with the, with the Spirit of God, and, that, and he had access to the provision of God. And, and so I want to uh, speak to you today. Um, just like Cornelius, uh, the Lord wants to use you to build His temple, to, to give alms to the poor, to pray continually, and to, to uh, humble yourself before Him, so that He can bless you, so that He can bring resources into your life, uh, so that He can uh, bring the whole of heaven to bring grace into your life, so that you can be effective, that you can make a change, that you can be the light, that you can be uh, that one that the Lord used. And I have such a desire to be used of God, and I'm sure uh, you are also uh, willing to do that. So are you ready today uh, to say, yes, Lord, uh, I want to humble myself before you. I want to hear your word. I want to come in agreement with what you are saying about me. I want to speak that word and I want to be obedient to your instructions to my life. Are you willing to do that? Are you willing to give everything to him? Even your finances, even your time, even your decisions. I am so ready to do it and I've done it many times before and I want to do it again. Because I love Jesus with all my heart and I want to see his kingdom manifested on this earth that is so exciting uh, can you please in the comment section just uh, just uh, make a few statements there of faith to what what is god speaking into your life um, you know uh, are you willing to make that decision are you willing to say yes lord i make a decision uh, to follow after you and to humble myself before you and to just uh, set my life apart for you yeah god is so good um, let, let me pray with you so father thank you that we can come before you today, and Lord, we humble ourselves before you. Uh, and Lord, you said in your word uh, that you resist the pride, the, the proud, but you give you give grace to the humble. And Lord, we receive that grace into our lives. Lord, thank you for your divine enablements that you're giving us, unmerited favor. Um, the expression of your love towards us is just coming to us. And Lord, thank you that you forgive us, that you wash us clean. Uh, by the blood of Jesus, and Lord, that we can stand humbled before you. And so, Lord, we receive now uh, that uh, white gown on our lives. Lord, uh, we receive a, a crown of sonship. And Lord, thank you that we are being manifested as sons of God, full of the authority of God. And Lord, we receive your grace upon our lives. We give you honor and praise in the name of Jesus. Amen. Awesome. And so, such so a privilege for me to minister to you tonight and to talk with you about these scriptures. I uh, know I read a lot of scriptures, but it's good for us to just learn and, and, and build faith inside of our spirit. I want to encourage you. I, I am going to add more prayer warriors to our Unity with Heaven prayer team. And we're going to really, um, with effort, start to pray for you because... Uh, I believe that the Lord is going to send these angels to you and they are going to start to just uh, set things up just like it happened here with Cornelius' life. Uh, that the Lord sent the angel, he sent these men out and uh, uh, the Lord could bring an intersection into Cornelius' life that he could be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so in the same way, heaven uh, wants to fight for you. And so um, uh, I'm going to do what I can do and, and that is I can uh, speak God's word over your life. Uh, I can pray for you. Uh, and I can communicate with you. So if you have any prayer requests, please put it for me in the comment section. Uh, and if uh, you would like to receive personal prophetic ministry, uh, I have the team here uh, in our studio every Monday evening. Uh, we meet at 7 o'clock, so we usually go live around about quarter past 7. And then also on every Friday evening. But I want to pray for you. And so if you need prayer, put your name in the comment section. Uh, and I look forward to see you Monday evening. God bless you. It's all right.